Hello, everyone. Ooh, it got quiet. That was nice. <laughs> awesome. Um, my name is Ranger Smokey, and I'll be giving the program here this evening. Uh, as we get started, uh, I'd like to share with you a couple just logistical campground details um, to make your stay here more comfortable, more fun, more safe. So who here is it their first time camping at the New Halo campground? Yeah, loud and proud. Yay! Hi. Oh, welcome, y'all. I hope you're liking it. Yeah, cool. So here in the campground, we have a couple um, logistical things that are here to help all of us have a good time. So we have quiet hours there from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. And for generators, it's a little bit different. For generators, it's 8 p.m. to 8 a.m., so a little bit shorter. We also have a lot of wildlife in this park, and wildlife also likes to come into our campground now and again. And wildlife can be anything from the smallest chipmunk to a black bear. And so that means we ask you to be very diligent with uh, food safety. So critters of all sizes love food of all kinds. And so that means that if you are in your campground and you have food out and you're not using it, they can actually get at that food. So we ask you to put your food when you're not actively eating it, of course, back in your car, or if you're at one of the walk-in sites and it's just really kind of inconvenient to always go put your stuff back in your car, there are these uh, metal boxes where you can store your food, which are these uh, bear boxes, okay? We also have a visitor center, which is about a five minute, five, 10 minute walk up the road, or you can drive your car up there as well. The visitor center is open from 9 a.m. in the morning to 5 p.m. in the evening time, every day. And we opened the front entrance again, they were painting, but now the front entrance is open, so you can walk through the front doors again, which is really exciting. It's not confusing anymore. <laughs> So, I highly encourage you to go see the Visitor Center. It's a really beautiful building and we have a lot of great interpretive information in there for you. We also have a series of programs that are going on every night uh, here in New Halem. And we also have one program going on tomorrow night um, in the actual town of New Halem. So, that starts at 8 p.m. That's tomorrow. It's called New Halem at Night. And we have a suite of programs that happen here every night. So, tomorrow, if you're interested, you can come learn about fishers, which are an interesting weasel type animal that used to live in the park, perhaps, and might be getting reintroduced. It's really cool. I highly encourage you to come. This evening, we are going to discover some of the rich human history of habitation, struggle, and survival in this incredible place. So many people today view this park as this vast wilderness area. It's very remote, rugged, it's a challenging place, and if you want to come visit, generally you have to plan ahead and prepare. Now, you can see some of those challenges perhaps in the amount of things that you brought up here in your car, for example. Or maybe you can think of how many days did it take you to plan your trip up here? Probably more than one, right? <laughs> or another example of the challenging nature of visiting this park is you can think of the hikers who go into the backcountry they're always carrying these very heavy, bulky packs, just perhaps to do even one night. So it's very challenging to visit this park, but actually, within this park and amidst the mountains here, there's abundant evidence of people who not only visited, but actually stayed, survived, and found a home in this incredible place. Today, tribes such as the Upper Skagit, the Swinomish, the Soxhuatl, the Nooksack, the Stolo, the Inglakatma, and the Confederated Tribes of the Colville and Yakima Reservations all have strong ties to this area, and some still live close to the park. Their traces in this area and their traces on the landscape are difficult to see, but if we look close enough, the North Cascades begin to look much differently. So since we are exploring the past this evening, Let's travel back in time together, shall we? So I'd like you all to close your eyes, close your eyes for me, and imagine what you think this landscape would have looked like 10,000 years ago. <laughs> the huge ice sheet that came down from Canada has begin, begun to recede. Ground that was once covered in snow and ice, thousands of feet thick is now open to the air again. The world is green again in this area. Things are melting. So imagine what you think this place would have looked like. 
And once you've found that image in your head, I'd like you to open <coughs> your eyes and answer for me this question. What parts of that landscape that you just imagined would have made it a good home? You can just shout them out. The abundant water. Abundant water, yeah. The Skagit River is right next to this campground. What else? Probably critters to eat. <laughs> there are some critters around here, you're right. There's abundant resources both uh, like in water and in food resources as well, like the animals and plants around here. Anything else? Let's go for three. Let's get one more. <laughs> the wood? What's that? The wood. The yeah. St structures and... How many trees do we have around here? <laughs> there are a lot of trees around here. And what would you use that wood for? Fuel. Fuel. Houses. Yeah, buildings. Canoes. <laughs> Canoes, thank you, yeah. The trees here can be used for practically everything. So... All of these reasons mean this place is actually a good place to make a home. And people have been calling the North Cascades home for at least 10,000 years. A couple decades ago, it was originally thought that people didn't come into these mountains, that they had no reason to. It was too rugged, it was too remote. And there are enough resources on either sides of the mountains <coughs> that why would they leave? And that was the traditional thought of archeologists here. So we know this today, to be very untrue. We have found artifacts in this park that go back almost 10,000 years. The oldest artifact that has been carbon dated, that has been found in this park, is over 9,600 years old when it was manipulated. So 9,600 years ago, people carved a particular piece of stone into a point. This particular piece of stone is called Hosamine Church. And I have a piece of it right here. It's hard to see. Now this type of stone is flint. So it breaks apart very easily. It's very easy to shape. And it's one of the softer types of rock. What's special about this piece of rock and Hosamine shirt itself is that it comes from a very specific place. This type of stone only comes from Hosamine Mountain, which is way up to the north on Ross Lake. Now, 9,600 years ago, give or take, someone decided to knock that stone out of the mountain and to carve it using a method probably similar to this, where you would take a harder stone that's not made of flint and you would hit it very, very hard against this stone and carve it into whatever shape you want. Could you pass that around, please? Thank you. That particular piece of Hosamine Chert, that very, very old one, is over 9,600 years old, give or take. But archaeologists have actually found arrowheads on Ross Lake as well that look to be over 10,000 years old. So they haven't been carbon dated, but they're made in a very specific shape that only comes from about 10,000 years ago, a very particular time in history. So we believe that people have been in this area for over 10,000 years. We can find evidence of people low down in the valleys, very low, like places like Ross Lake, or we can fi find evidence of people high up in the Alpine, high up in the mountains. That piece of Hosamine shirt, that 9,600 year old artifact, was actually found not at Mount Hosamine, where it was quarried. It was actually found high up at Cascade Pass, which is over 5,000 feet above sea level. This particular place was a common trading route for humans for over 8,000 years. Archaeologists here have found evidence of stone tools, of arrowheads or projectile points. They have found human remains, planted animal remains. They've also found the remnants of pit houses, which a pit house, if you can imagine, imagine we were to cut out a circle right here, a very big circle that we could probably fit 15 people in very snugly. And we dug down about five feet. And then we put a circular dome over top of this hole that we've dug in the ground with a smoke hole right in the middle. That's what a pit house is. It's a partially submerged in the ground house. Archaeologists have also found evidence of lodges, which are similar to structures built today that use planks. And they've also found places where people process and use food. 
and places where people quarried for stone, such as Mean Church. In fact, there was one study up on Ross Lake that found two to 32 archeological sites per square kilometer. Now that is the equivalent of walking six city blocks and finding five archeology span sites in each block. So the evidence here is extremely abundant. And if that isn't enough for you, you can just look at the names of the places that are here in the North Cascades. The name of your campground, the campground that we're currently all staying in, New Halem is actually an interpretation of a Salish word that means the place to hunt mountain goats. Like this one right here. Stahican, which was a place you could access from Cascade Pass, where the oldest dated artifact in the park was found. Stahican is a word that means the way through, and it signifies that traditional passage from east to west through the mountains. Hosamine itself, the place where Hosamine chert is quarried, Hosamine means sharp like a knife. And that echoes the shape of the mountain, and it also resembles the shape of the stone tools that Hosamine chert was fashioned into. So we can hear the echoes of the people who have been here for thousands of years, even in the names of the places that we experience today here in the park. So we know based on oral tradition and archeological evidence that people have been here for a very long time. But the next question to ask is, how? How have people been here in this seemingly very rugged, very harsh environment? So early people, early foraging people, foraging means traveling from place to place and hunting and gathering for your food. Early foraging people used a certain set of skills, knowledge, thank you, my dear, and gear to survive. So if you were asked to survive in this place, let's say for two weeks, let's give it a number. What do you think are some of the challenges you are going to encounter to surviving in this place? Again, you can just shout them out. What was that? Yeah, cold weather. You know what, today was pretty nice, but I tell you what, it gets real chilly here in the winter time. Very chilly. <laughs> Especially when it's like raining and the wind is coming, it's... Rain. Yeah, rain. Rain. Mm -hmm. This is a very wet environment when it's not the summertime. What else? What are some of the challenges you would have to surviving here? Fire. Fire. <coughs> we do, yeah, there is a fire regime here in the park. Fire comes through every now and then. What else? What would be on your mind if someone just planted you out in the woods? What would be the first thing you would think of? Food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah! <laughs> Yeah, you'd probably be wondering, where am I going to find food? Where is a water source? How do I build a shelter? So people have been asking that same question here in this landscape for at least 10,000 years. So we can go to the first thing I heard people say, which was people were talking about the elements, so the risk of what we call exposure. Now, early foraging people reduced the risk of exposure with a couple of special types of gear. Now, what they would do is they would have, in the wintertime, very thick clothing, and in that clothing they would actually put mountain goat wool. <laughs> Probably mountain goat wool, perhaps, that came from this very area. Now, they would use mountain goat wool to pad their clothing during the wintertime so that they could keep all the cold <coughs> elements out and keep their keep um, their body insulated instead of losing all that heat and ri risking basically hypothermia. Another thing they would use is very thick outer layers of resistant abrasion, resistant leather. So if you're hiking out in the Cascades and there's a potential for some rain and for, for wind, you probably aren't going to want lots of holes in your rain jacket, right? And you probably don't want a lot of holes in your pants either. So these thick outer layers of leather help people keep from having all of the rain and the wind and the snow get into their garments and make them cold or risk the risk hypothermia. Basically. So another challenge that I heard people speak of, which we got to, was food, right? People have been asking that question for a long time here. Where am I going to find food? <coughs> So early foraging people had a very specific practice. They would move from place to place very often, and this meant that they wouldn't deplete the resources at any given place. 
So when they had built a very temporary shelter at one spot and decided, oh, we're starting to see less berries here, I don't see as many deer, then they would move on to another site. And they would travel in very small groups to do so, okay? They would also use their knowledge of the landscape. They had intimate knowledge of this place. They knew when the huckleberries were going to be ripe at Cascade Pass. They knew when the salmon were going to be running and up what tributaries they liked to spawn in. And they knew when the deer liked to browse and when they could find them there. And all of this information helped them survive in this place. So all of those things combined helped early foragers reduce the risk of starvation and exposure. So what we can do is you can revisit that image in your head. Do you remember your prehistoric <coughs> landscape? So you can think of that landscape and see very small groups of people moving across that landscape. And they're building very temporary shelters out of the places around them. They're not staying too long. Perhaps they're building a fire. Perhaps they're going to forage for berries. Perhaps someone is using a stone tool to carve an arrowhead, to chip away at an arrowhead. And perhaps someone is removing the skin from a deer to make a leather garment. So now we've added a little piece to our landscape that we've created in our heads. Okay. However, as time progressed and culture changed, so too did early foraging lifestyle. So around 4,000 years ago or so, <coughs> Early foragers continued to be adapt to the challenge of making a home in the North Cascades by becoming less mobile and building more permanent structures. So around this time, people began to use more pit houses and more <coughs> lodges, which are made of planks, much like the planks that we see on this building right here, okay? And a special thing about the lodges that are built in this area is that they are very good at regulating their temperature. And it's because of the wood that is used. So you can imagine that, say, this whole front of this building is made up of these planks. Now, in the winter time, when it's very wet and it's very cold, what these planks will do is they will actually soak up a lot of the moisture around them, actually expand to get bigger. And when the summertime comes and it gets very hot and maybe a little smoky as well, those boards will actually contract. And so what you get is in the summertime, you get this drafty house that has a lot of airflow. And in the wintertime, you get a very insulated house because there are no cracks between these planks right here. Okay? So to get in the mindset of that shift between a foraging culture to what, what I'm going to call a collector culture, I need the help of my volunteers. So my three volunteers, could you come up to the stage, please? It's your time to shine. <laughs> OK, so let's stand and face the audience. And I would like you to tell them your name. What is your name? My name is Latal. Latal. My name is Emma. This is my Emma. Name, my name is Quinn. And this is Quinn, OK? So they are going to help us visualize the change from a forager culture to a collector culture, okay? So, Latal, do you, do you mind going first for us? Okay, so here's how this is going to work. Latal is going to use her speedy running <coughs> skills, and when I say go, she is going to run around and pick up all of the pictures that are on the ground here. And when she picks up a picture, she can only pick up one at a time, but she is going to pick it up and she's going to hold it up high above her head, hopefully so everyone can see. Yep, we might have to use tippy toes. And when she does that, she is eating a food source, okay? So perhaps she might find a deer, or a mountain goat, or a beaver. And when she does that, we need to help her, okay? We need to help her know when it's time to move on to the next food resource. So what we're going to do is when she holds something up, we're going to count down from five, okay? Five, four, three, two, one, all right? And you have, Latal, you have exactly one minute to do this. Are you ready? Yeah. Are you feeling pumped? Okay, are we all ready? Yeah! Okay, ready, set, go, Latal! Five, four, three, two, one! Put it back, put it back, put it back down! Wow! Yeah! Cheer on! Cheer on! Okay, five! Five, four, three, two, one!
good one. It's a beaver. Five, four, three, two, one. for food. Now we're going to see Emma and Quinn forage for food, but they're going to do it in a very different way. These ladies are from a later period in time, so they have developed permanent structures and they have figured out ways to store food, maybe underground where it's colder or drying salmon, for example. So what they're going to do, instead of holding up pictures and us counting for them, they are going to pick up as many pictures as they can and put them in this basket right here, which is where they're their lodge is located. Does that sound good? Okay, but here's the rule though. You can't run around, grab all of them, and then come back. You have to do it one at a time. Do you understand? You ready? Mm -hmm. Okay, are we ready? Yeah. All we have to do is help them now. There's no counting involved. <laughs> okay, on your mark, get set, go! surviving in this place. So 
even the people living 10,000 years ago and the people living around 4,000 years ago, all they were focused on was surviving. And this rich history of survival is widely unknown both to people who visit the park and to locals as well. And to understand the reason why, we have to look to the landscape for answers. So archaeology is extremely difficult to study in this national park. For those of you who have been to places such as Mesa Verde, or perhaps seen photos or heard stories of places in the Southwest where you can walk into the home that someone built 5,000 years ago and see the pottery there on the ground that they used on a daily basis, you know that these places are very good at preserving signs of human presence. These places are generally dry, have little vegetation, and to be honest, they're pretty easy to get to. So the North Cascades are the exact opposite of all of those things. It's very wet here. Right now, the summertime has been pretty nice, but for the most part, this park is really wet, and our climate can be pretty extreme at some points. And that means when artifacts get in the ground, they often deteriorate because the soil is so wet and fairly acidic as well. So unless that artifact is made of stone, for the most part, it's going to deteriorate in the soil. Another thing is, if you look at the ground cover here, just glance around, there are places where the ferns and the salal is so thick that you can't even see the ground. And this means when archaeologists are out looking for artifacts that potentially might be on the surface of the ground, they can't even see it because all the ground is covered up by plants. So it makes spotting artifacts very difficult. And finally, this area has a lot of mountains, right? It's very hard to get from one place to another without a lot of effort. The topography here is extreme, and that means when perhaps you're trying to access a potential site, it's extremely hard to get there. And perhaps there are lots of places here in the park that have art artifacts and archaeological remains, but we haven't found them yet because it's very difficult to access all of these places we want to explore. So because of all these re reasons, archaeology is very difficult to study here in this park. But despite this difficulty and this challenge, we continue to discover the stories of people who have been here since time immemorial. So I'd like us all to go back to the beginning, okay? I'd like you all to close your eyes again and revisit that landscape you created in your head at the very beginning. So find that landscape. But now this time, I'd like you to add in that same picture, I'd like you to add a large lodge at a place where a stream meets a river. I'd like you to add people <coughs> quarrying for stone and breaking flint apart to create arrowheads. I'd like you to add in that picture people processing food, people taking the hides off deer, putting the meat aside and putting the skin aside to make some sort of clothing garment. I'd like you to imagine all of these places and all of these people connected by a faint network of trails. And I'd like you to imagine smoke rising from many different campfires amidst the high peaks. So now you can open your eyes. So now we together have created a more accurate picture of the prehistoric North Cascades landscape, landscape and what the people and the place looked like. The story of the North Cascades is as much about people as it is about place. So the next time you look at mountains like this, perhaps the question to ask is what is the story here? Who was here? And who perhaps is still here? So we have, together we've explored the past. We've found some of the struggles that it takes to visit and live and find home in this place. And we've explored some of the changes that people experienced here in the park. Living in the North Cascades amidst these peaks is not easy, but people have been making a home here for at least 10,000 years. So now I'd like you to think of your home. So think of your home for a moment. The feelings that come up for us when we think of our home places have been with people in this area for at least 10,000 years. The North Cascades have provided for people since time immemorial and today we feel that connection and inspiration. Thank you everyone. 
I really appreciate you all being here this evening. For those of you that are interested in learning more about the cultural history here in the park, you are about a 15 minutes walk from a very, very interesting and important cultural site called the Rock Shelter. If you want to, you can walk up the linking trail to the Rock Shelter Trail and you can see the smoke scars on the rocks where people have been burning campfire after campfire after campfire for at least a thousand years. So if you're interested in learning more, I encourage you to go explore that site or please come to the visitor center where we can give you a lot more information, okay? For those of you that would like to go continue your evening at your campsite, I welcome you to get up and do so. I know I always get a little nervous at the end of a program where I'm not sure if I'm okay to get up while people are asking questions. I'm going to stay here and take questions. So for those of you that have enjoyed the program and are ready to head back to your campsite, you're welcome to do so. For those of you that have questions, I will be here. Thank you.